guys, how are you? Hey. <laughs> Michael, it's been forever. Wow. Isn't it amazing how huh? three years of COVID just sort of like, it's like a, yeah, created this window. It was crazy. Good to see you. Yeah. Well, welcome. So glad to be here. You guys, isn't that amazing? Like, couldn't you just listen to him read a phone book? His voice is so amazing. It's, it's, just, it's just awesome. It's a pleasure to have you here, Manu. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, we actually met the very first year, I think, that they're doing FanX in Salt Lake City. And you told me one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard in my life. Mm. And you're talking about like overcoming adversity and like how when, when you were in high school, there was this guy who was kind of a bit of a bully. And it left such an impression on me. I was wondering if you'd be kind enough to share that story for, the, for everybody here in Atlanta. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't just a bit of a bully. He was like the Arzog of bullies. Yeah. And, and, and as a matter of fact, he, he, he brought something up which I found really so interesting because he said to me, I think when you were playing Arzog, you were playing me. And when he said that, I suddenly realized he might have been right. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, just to give you a, a little background on that, I, I was like, you know, one of the reasons I got into the arts, I guess, I was like 15 and I was in a car accident and my mother was killed. And, uh, you know, just one of these tough lessons of life, you know, it happens. And, you know, when you're a young person, it, it, it uh, you know, it really rocks your faith and your, your whole kind of sense of being and, uh, and whatnot. And, and uh, yeah, luckily I had a girlfriend who was a ballet dancer and so I went and did ballet. And uh, I, was doing, I was trying to do sports and dance and a whole bunch of things that would keep it kind of like, I don't know, I guess these things sort of guided me into the arts and, and being an actor and, you, you know, but, but um, yeah, just, just um, when I first lost my mother, I was, I was sent to a boarding school. I, I went to a boarding school. And there was a guy, uh, it was in New Zealand. And uh, there was a Maori, it was a Maori boys boarding school. So it was big, you know, big boys. And uh, you have to understand a little bit about our culture as well, because, you know, the Maori were kind of like second class citizens for a long time. And, uh, you know, these Maori boys schools were set up to educate the natives and, and, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of angst there, you know, a lot of, and, and probably the way that a lot of these guys grew up was tough. And I got there and was thrown in the midst of what felt like a prison, you know. And this, this one big guy was the main bully. And he had to, when, when I say he, he told me, he, he really looked like Arzog. He was, he was like, he had a shaved head, just no neck, you know, and just, you saw him walking around school and you just had to get out of the way. He just was, was so uh, aggressive. Anyway, he, uh, he ended up beating me up uh, quite ferociously one time. Uh, is is there my keeps on coming on and off? Is it a battery issue? Um, and uh, I, I got chosen in the first fifteen rugby team, and uh, so he kind of wanted to. Uh, well, you know, to make the first fifteen rugby team yeah, yeah, was a big honour. And I'd just arrived out of nowhere. He, I don't, he didn't really know that I'd lost my mother or anything like that. But he just came and he beat, he beat the life out of me, really. Um, it, was, it was quite a severe beating. Not your average. Like, I was, I was in high school. I had a few blues. You know, I had a few fights. But this was a really, really violent beating. And um, I ended up not really staying at that school more than a year. And then I went on, went on with my career and when I got to being in The Hobbit and playing Arzog, the very last shoot day that I was flying back down to Wellington to perform with Peter Jackson, the last day as, of my Arzog filming, I ran into this guy in the airport and he, he was like, he was like, Manu. And I, and I knew just hearing his voice, it was him. I didn't even, it was like, oh, after all of these years. And he walked around in front of me and, head and and he and he said 
you know, I just want to apologize to you because I've seen what you've done with your career and how you've, you know, you've worked so hard. He ended up being in the All Blacks. So, you know, he, he was a very hard working rugby, you know, he's, he was a really dedicated person himself, you know. And, and it was a, just this, I don't know, it was like, it was a, a full circle thing. And I said to him, Norm, you know what, you, you don't have to apologize because you're the only person I remember. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and uh, I don't know. You know, without him actually beating me up at that at that at that, at that school, I may have I may have st stayed in my shell, my emotional shell. You know, I was going through you know, having lost my mother. You know, I was, and all of a sudden he sort of made me like everything was. You know, <clears throat> you know, I have to survive. You know, I have to fight to survive. So you know, whether that you know, of course, all that would have affected my choices in Spartacus. You know? Yeah. I mean, playing the bully against Andy Whitfield. And then, of course, when I did this giant bald headed orc. And I didn't really add it up until he said to me, You were playing me. <laughs> so I kind of, I, I, and I, and I, I really, I, I suddenly realized, you know what? Where else did I make those choices from, you know? Yeah. And I said, you're right, you're right, Norm, you know, it's like you gave me that to work on, work off, whether it was a, you know, positive, negative thing, whatever it ended up being. Yeah. So, uh, but we ended up making a documentary, he and I, about that particular incident, and uh, we won the New Zealand Best Documentary Award for it, because of the way that it confronted the aspects of bullying and, and what makes a man after all these years, and what was in the life of the young man. We've got on, on and off. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Woods. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's amazing how you had that experience, um, and you were able to turn it into something so positive. And that speaks volumes about your character because when people have that experience, like with your mother, and then being bullied, they could just retreat. And you took that opportunity to better yourself, and that just shows a lot of fortitude. How did you decide to, when did you, what made you have that desire to like perform and to be, act, and be an actor? What made you want to come out of your shell and do that? Uh, I took a trip to America, and at that stage I was doing ballet. I almost went to, to like the Juilliard School in New York to study ballet. Um, I was, heading toward getting into something like the Australian Ballet Company, because I was doing like a Steadfords. I, I, I was good at lifting up the ballerinas and kind of, you know, doing the pas de deux, it's called pas de deux work. Um, when I tell people that they, they kind of, you know, it, it doesn't, <laughs> death stroke <laughs> and a tutu, you know, but, or Azog, you know, or Crixus. But, uh, you, you know, I mean, the movement skills that I learned as a dancer was definitely things that I've incorporated in my, um, in my, the dynamic of my, my action. Um, you know, people usually come to me and they go like, oh, did you study, you know, sword fighting? Did you study how to, how to you know, be a gladiator and all those sort of things? I said, no, I studied ballet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but the way that I moved, you know, was, uh, it was fluid. And, if, and I had to do choreography. You know, you get a flat-footed actor, and it's, you, you can spend half a day, and they'll still not get the choreography right. Whereas, the moment uh, <coughs> the, the choreographer said, "Okay, you're going to spin this way and do this and do that," I, I, I had it like that, and that was one thing that the stunt guys always said to me: "Yeah, oh, mate, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll cut your uh, re your rehearsal time down to like 15 minutes instead of two hours," you know, because I I I'd just get it, you know. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, but you know, I mean, you know, having been through, I guess, the emotional stuff that I went through, you know, it, it made me really understand, you know, I, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, I spoke about my mother, but my brother was in another car accident and, um, and you know, I lost him um, whilst holding his hand, you know, and, uh, and sometimes I, I've reflected on people that have come to me and, and said like, you know, your role as Crixus made me cry or, you know, sometimes even uh, like soldiers that have come back from 
Afghanistan, you know, a lot of, a lot of Marines and, and soldiers from the US military come to me and, and they'll have, like some of them have got PTSD and they come with their wives, and, and, but they tell me incredible stories that I find really hard to sort of relate to because, you know, I'm on the safety of a set and all this sort of stuff, but they'll say to me, you know what, like one guy just recently came to me and he said, you, you know, our battalion, we'd go into a fight going, going for Crixus, boom, like this, and I'm going like, guys, like, like, Really, and he, and he lost half of his half of his crew, you know. And, and I, I found that really just sort of disturbing in a way that, that you know you're kind of like carrying such a uh, uh, an influence upon people. But but then I remembered that what I put into the acting, and when I was in the most difficult times as Crixus or whatever like that, I would dig into this loss of my own in my own life, and that's on the same level, you know. And if you can hit that note, it's like musically you're hitting a note that people have in their lives and it's like this ding and, 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 it, and it resonates you know and, and as, a, as an actor you, you have that opportunity you know if you've yeah. got it in your paint box to put that level out there and uh, you know luckily you know in, in roles like you know like the role of Crixus you know there was just so much space in which to use a lot of the stuff that I'd been through you know having to fight amongst men for my own position having to you know like reconnect with a woman like Navia, you know, like, you know, there was sort of the, you know, I, mean, I remember the final scene that I did with Cynthia, um, and she was the second Navia. Are the Spartacus fans here at all? Yeah, okay, a couple, yeah. Sorry, kid. <laughs> but, you, you, you know, I, I, it's, it's amazing where you have to go, you know, as an actor sometimes. And I, and I remember walking in, it was my death scene, you know, like, Crixus gets the, <laughs> gets the chop. And, um, and I, uh, I walked onto set and I had no, I'd, I'd really struggled with what was going to be my last scene uh, of the whole series, you know. I thought, what's going to happen after this scene? It's all going to be over, you know. And it sort of was getting in the way of my thinking about what I was going to do in the scene, right? <laughs> and so when I got on the, on the set, I thought, oh my, I don't even have a decision about how I'm going to die, you know. I know they're going to, you know, this guy's going to swing a sword and that's the end of it. And, uh, and the director had told me how they were going to shoot it with like, you know, it was in the reflection in Navia's eye, and and uh, and I, when I came in, I saw Navia crying in the corner, or Cynthia. I saw it actually in tears. You know, when we're just about to, you know, five minutes out, and I walked up and I said, "You okay, darling?" And she she had grown up without her father. Her parents are separated, and so she'd actually not met her father until like literally a year before this particular day that we were shooting. Right? She'd only caught up with him and found him in London. And he had cancer and passed away. And I went, and, and she said to me, you know, it's like this scene where I'm losing you, I'm trying to find something and, and all I can think of is losing my father. And I went into that scene not acting with Navia, I went into that scene acting with Cynthia, you know, because I understood that, that pain and that loss. And, and so the whole time, and, and it's, 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 when I, whenever I watch that scene, like I was, I was completely oblivious to the camera. It was the most immersed I got as an artist. You know, because because it should be about you know, like the most perfect art is to really be in the absolute human condition and the absolute signal that you can do in like music or painting or acting or whatever. You know, you, it just it's like it's like light, lightning. It's an element that suddenly happens. And and if, if you if you watch that scene. Her and I are so locked in this. And I'm just, I was really just looking at her going, it's going to be okay. You, you, you're, you're going to be okay. You know, I get it. I understand it. And the set photographer took a photo of after they said cut. I went over to her and I just, I, I just leaned my forehead against her forehead, sort of gave her a hongi, which is a Maori practice. And, and I, and I, and, and the, and the, the set photographer took a photo of this moment and, I'm, and, and it's like, <laughs> when I think about working with an actress or, or whatever and, and having a real golden moment, that, that photo was, is just like, I, we didn't even know the set photographer was there, you know, and he just got this, he got this moment and it's, um, it's really, really beautiful. I don't know, have I strayed off the question? I forgot what the question was. Just telling your stories. That's fine. We actually, I think we have somebody who wanted to ask a question over there. Oh, hello. Hi. 
Um, so I loved you as playing Deathstroke in the Arrowverse. By, probably by far one of my favorite bad guys in all of um, Arrow. Uh, do you have any cool stories about um, play, um, acting with Stephen Amell or any of the actors on that show? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, it was, it was um, a few people have been asking me about it today and I've, I've sort of been reflecting on kind of like, you know, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was kind of like going from classical, historical to like modern pop culture, you know, in terms of what the two shows were kind of like. Like, you know, I was used to running around in a historical costume based in history, you know, speaking a kind of a old English kind of dialogue, you know, like in Spartacus, it was, it was interesting to suddenly just being in this very modern fast beat, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, you sort of get used to what the look and the style and the, and the tone of the show is. And, uh, but the thing is, one of the, one of the, one of the strangest sort of circumstances about the whole Arrow thing was Stephen Amell, uh, when Andy Whitfield got sick on Spartacus and they made a decision to keep going with the show but they were going to cast a new Spartacus. So three people were flown to New Zealand to read with me and to read with Katrina Law in two sort of audition scenes, like screen tests. And it was... Uh, Liam McIntyre, who ended up getting the role, a guy from New York who had dark hair, but he went out that night and got drunk and stood on a bar in, in the middle of Auckland, New Zealand, and went, I have Spartacus. And it got back to the producers, and they put him on a plane the next day and flew him home. <laughs> he screwed up. I thought he was the one that was going to get it, actually. I told, him, I, I told him that as well, so I think it went to his head, and he went out and got drunk and jumped up and went, I have Spartacus. <laughs> And sometimes I think to myself, like, I wish I'd never said that to him. <laughs> but it wasn't my choice to do that. But, um, and the other one was Stephen Amell. Stephen Amell flew, flew over to New Zealand to, to try out for, for the role of Spartacus. And um, yeah, he, he, he didn't quite get his, his thing together on that day. But of course, then he was cast as Arrow. And uh, I remember arriving from a USO tour. I did a USO tour in Kuwait. Um, and I, yeah, cheers, um, and yeah, an ama amazing experience to see all those young men on that move before and after, you know, yeah, yeah incredible. But, um, but, but we, we've arrived in Los Angeles and there was a big billboard with the Green Arrow, you know, this, this show was starting up and, and I, I, I remember speaking to my agent saying like, oh, I've, I've seen that, you know, that Arrow show that's on and that guy, Stephen Amell, you know, he came across and tried out for Spartacus and, well, there it is. And she rang me up two days later and goes, Manu, you know, we've got this audition for you with the Green Arrow. And it was like, I'd met him already, you know, <laughs> Stephen, that is, you know, and it was, it was, I don't know, it was like, it was like magnetism in the universe. I don't know, just, just certain things that happened and it just didn't feel unusual at all that that was connecting that way, you know? And um, so when I met him on set, you know, it was interesting because when he, when he was auditioning for Spartacus, he was uncomfortable. And so I, I, I said, come on, let's, let's go for a run around the studio. So we, we went out and we ran a couple of blocks around the studio just so that he'd breathe and get himself kind of uh, relaxed a bit. And, uh, but I'm sure that when I arrived, he was like, it's Crixus. <laughs> <laughs> so we had some healthy competition right from the get-go, you know, like, because he was, you know, in that position in his show and I'd been in my show and it was kind of like a, yeah, it just felt like we went straight off at a really good kind of comfortable level. But, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. People seem to enjoy it, and the Deathstroke and the Oliver Queen story. So I think we did our job, did our job well. He's a very hard worker. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Hi. Um, what's the most memorable audition you ever went on, good or bad? Um, well, for Spartacus, uh, I heard about it, and um, my agent rang me, and, uh, and, and I... You know, was like, well, oh, okay, this, this sounds awesome, you know, gladiators, and, you know, I've got the physical, you know, 
preparedness because of all the things I've done, sport and, and dance and all this stuff. So I, so I thought, oh, well, you know, I, I'm in good shape for this, you know. And so I, so I walked into the uh, casting department, to the um, Liz, Liz Mulliner's casting in Sydney, and um, and all the, the it was all like 19 year old, very very young people were in there, and you know they're all standing in the hallway like you know with hope as young actors, you know, all walking around going like I am Spartacus, like, you know, all these variations of they're all sort of rehearsing their what the what the audition script was. And I was like, oh, these guys do look very young. And then when I walked in, the casting agent, Liz, she said to me, Manu, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here to like read for Spartacus. And she goes, oh, you're too old. <laughs> I, was, I was 38 at the time. And she said, no, 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 no. All the gladiators were dead by the time they were 25, you know. And so when I first stood in front of the camera for my screen test for Spartacus, I was like, ah, this isn't going to work out. <laughs> and so I did, I did this kind of like, you know, what is beneath your feet, you know, some, some sort of thing. And, uh, and, and I walked out of the room just thinking like, no, nah, it's never going to happen. And, uh, and she called up like a month later, like it was a long time after, and she goes, oh, Manu, uh, they actually want to see you again, you know, and, uh, and it, it kind of... I, then, I, then I read for uh, Enemaeus, you know, that was played by Peter Mensah. Can you imagine, right? You know, I'm going like, you know, that's, that was the what is beneath your feet, you know, audition. And then I, I didn't get that one, didn't hear from them for another month. And they rang up and they said, oh, they want you to read for another character called Barker. And so I read for Barker. And then they were going to fly me to America. And on the morning of my flight, they rang up and cancelled. And, and, and they said, oh, no, they're going to cast that locally in New Zealand because that character's going to die in episode four now. So I, it was like the heartbreak hill was, was uh, Spartacus. It was like so many no's and, and kind of like I had hope and then uh, and hope. And then, uh, and then finally, um, my manager rang up and she goes, Manu, there's a role called Cr Crickus. <laughs> she couldn't say the word. I was going, what's it called? Crickus. And so I thought it was Crickus at first. And then in the read, in the, in the first read we did, Peter Mensah went, Crecious. I was like, I hope it's not Crecious. So, yeah, it ended up being Crecious, but, but you know. Um, but just, yeah, yeah, funny things like that. Then a very, the, yeah, I, I, got, I got invited in for this screen test, and I went and I swam all more. I went down to the swimming pool, and I did this morning of getting myself ready and kind of like, you know, being very, trying to be very, very calm. Um, and, and, and I got into the studio and there was nobody there. And it, it went 15, 20 minutes past my audition time and then suddenly out comes Liz again, right? Who shut me down on the first audition and she came out and she goes, oh no, so it's Faith Martin, because you're filming this. Sorry, sorry, Faith, I got that wrong. Faith Martin, if she ever sees. But Faith, so Faith, Faith was like, Manu, what are you doing here? Like the same, like the first time, you know? And I'm like, what are you, I'm here for my screen test, you know, for, for Crixus. And she went, ah, oh, sorry, Manu, like your agent and the, and the producers are, have had some disagreements about things like, you know, residuals and things like this. And, and so they've cancelled your, your, your screen test. You, you're not going to be reading for this anymore. And I was like, what? I said, I, I, this is my audition. It's not, it's not, it's not up to them. To and, and so she said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go, Manu, because I've got another thing that I've got to do right now. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to talk to your agent, but you've missed out because they've not been able to. And so I, so I left the casting agents. I was walking past this giant stadium, you know, like one of the football stadiums or something, thinking to myself, like, I'm never going to get inside the stadium. You know, I'm never going to get into the, the big arena of acting or whatever. You know, I remember that thought. And, um, and then I was just trying to call my agent in America and I finally got through to her and I said, Ruth, what's going on? She went, Manu, you know, we just asked the normal question, like residuals, you know, here in America. But if you're in New Zealand or Australia, you don't get it. That's the thing. They, they, we get ripped off, trust me. I could tell you some stories. I will tell you one in a second. But so I, I said to her, I want you to do something for me. I want you to ring them up and I want you to tell them that I will do this show for nothing because it's got nothing to do with points or money or anything like that. I'm here as an artist and I want my audition and I'll do it for nothing. 
told him those exact words. So he says, okay, man. And then she jumped off the phone and then I'm, I'm still walking. Like now I'm two kilometers away from the, it was a very, very hot day. And, and suddenly, you know, Faith rang up and goes, Manu, where are you? And I said, oh, I'm like, and she goes, get back in now. I've only got like 10 minutes to fit you in. And it was like, and I ran in this really hot, I got into the, I got in, I was sweating. I was like, my heart was boom, 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 boom. And she just went, Manu, okay, straight in front of the camera. Let's, let's just do it right now. And I, 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 had, I had no time to even gather myself, but it was perfect. It was, I, I was so, um, I was so full of like so much emotion, so much that when they said, she said, okay, Manu, an action. I just suddenly just, it was, you get these, these moments in your life, you, you just, you know, either you, you take that moment or it's gonna go. And I just went, <laughs> And all this energy, and I just remember being completely out of my body when I did it, and I was like doing this performance, and then at the end of it, I it was just like, he, that was it. You know, I, I, I had this really good feeling, and Faith sort of stuck her head from behind the corner and was like, Manu, that was really good. <laughs> I was like, well, thanks, you didn't really give me any help. Faith to get prepared for this. But, um, but yeah, but two months later, like I hadn't heard back, so I thought, I haven't got this role as well. About two months later, I was at the zoo in a bird cage with my oldest baby. My, my oldest girl was a baby. And I was sort of thinking, like, I'm never going to be able to afford to raise this child as an actor, you know. And uh, the phone rang. And it was uh, the producer, Rob Tappet. And he went, Manu, it's Rob Tappet, the producer of Spartacus. And I said, oh, hey, Rob. And he went, Manu, um, we all liked your audition, but we can't offer you the role. And I was like... Thanks for ringing up to rub it in. <laughs> and he said, well, Manu, remember when you worked on Xena, like, you know, back in 1999? And I went, yeah, yeah. And he goes, well, remember you had those fights with the uh, stunt guys and you guys decided not to use the stunt swords, but you used the heavy ones <laughs> and you were hitting each other? Because <laughs> I, I, I saw the stunt guys and I said, come on, these swords aren't that bad. Let's just hit each other because otherwise they'll all bend and everything. <laughs> And all these stunt guys are going, yeah, let's do it. So we're like, <laughs> we're whacking the hell out of each other. And then the safety officer came and said, hey, guys, stop, stop, stop. And anyway, I'd totally forgotten about that. But suddenly this is what Rob's saying to me, saying, listen, we can't hire you unless you promise not to hurt our Spartacus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was, yeah, and I, I was like, I remember going like this and I went, yeah, I, okay, I promise. <laughs> and yeah, but, but, but I, I, took the same, I took the same mentality as I had when I did Xena in, into Spartacus because, you know, if, if you do the training and you do a lot of work and you, and, you, and you really got your mind on the job and you're present, then it's amazing what you can do, you know, and, uh, and whenever I was working as Crixus, I didn't want to be any further away from the real character and the real person who died in 76 BC. I thought we were honoring these people and we, you know, as, as a gladiator, you just want to, you know, just bring in all of that fear and all of that blocking fear and all of that being caged up like an animal and, you know, I'd had elements of my life that had been like that. So I just wanted to bring all of that into it. So, so when I was on set, I was very, uh, I, was, I, was, I, I don't know whether you call it method, but I was definitely involved in the character on a very deep, deep level. Yeah. And, uh, and that was, uh, Anyway, I've, I've answered that question, but 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 yeah, it was it was it was a fascinating casting process, and and uh, yeah, I never thought I was going to get in, and finally, finally, it, it did happen. And then Rob went, Manu, now that you've promised, welcome to Spartacus. I remember those words. It was, it was that. That was one of the most incredible stories, Mon. I love that story. I mean, you, just, you kept getting the nose, and we kept going back, going back. It was wonderful. You guys, please give a huge round of applause, everybody, for Manu Bennett. Uh, run a little right. I'll answer it real fast. Real fast. All right, so I talked to all the Arrowverse actors, and they said their costumes are very hard to articulate their limbs in, like just move around. What was it like for the Deathstroke? Oh, it was a super outfit, actually. You know, it was really, really, really good. Um, it, it basically, I stepped into it lifted it up over my shoulders and zipped it up and that was it and then they'd sort of put three little canisters in the front did you know i had three like uh like things that you had using an un over under 
M16, like a, a, a launcher, a little, what do you call it? A grenade launcher? Grenade launcher, yeah. I had three of them on my, on my vest. Did you ever see Deathstroke use one of them ever? <laughs> <laughs> Superfluous to his needs, I think. These three grenades that were on the front of my vest. I always wondered if somebody shot me as well. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, when you were on Spartacus, Crixus was, <laughs> he was my favorite character, you know. And something I always uh, loved about him was how you could balance these, these grand war hero-like moments, such as the uh, battle against Arius, you know, when you deliver that amazing speech. And there's also moments of, well, poetry, really, where you say things such as, we are not a fist, but fingers twitching absent single purpose, you know, so you can switch between these, it's the same character, but they're these two distinct personalities, someone, someone pensive and someone just unstoppable. Uh, so it's kind of an acting question. How do, you, how, how do you do that? You know, how do you switch so seamlessly? Well, to be honest, when you pick up a script, each new script, when I, I noticed with the Spartacus scripts especially that it was like every script was a new journey for the character. You know, either I was like the leading bulldog, gladiator, champion, bully, Norm Hewitt from Chelty College, <laughs> you know, kind of thing, or I was this guy that was impossibly in love with somebody, you know, who was a slave girl, you know, kind of like trying to change the brain thought to a memory that he might have had of another world, you know, and, um, and then there was like everything from being the champion and winning fights to being slashed by Theocles and being kind of like, you know, uh, uh, crippled in certain ways by Domino and the last, fight. you know, there's just all these, it, you just kept on reading a script going like, wow. Okay, that's that part of the color wheel, you know, that part and that part, you know, it's like, as, as I was talking about musically, it was like a, a completely different kind of composition in each script and I'd have to sort of approach it with this, with this, yeah, these nuances that were, that were added, adding more complexity to the, to the character. And they were very good at doing that, you know, I, I, th I think they kind of, you know, saw that, I, because early on in the film, early on in the series, Rob Tappert called me to his office. And he said, Manu, what's with the open mouth, the f open frog mouth acting? Because I'd had a fight and I'd, I'd gone like, <laughs> like, because I'd killed somebody for the first time. So I was like, Aah! you know, I was like this like guttural scream. Because Rob likes Clint Eastwood. And if he wanted, if he'd directed me as, as, as Crixus, I would have been more minimal. Everything just would have been like, you know, just less, you know, emotional. And um, I, uh, I end up, ha you know, doing a balancing act with Rob, you know, in terms of what, what he wanted. But, but in the end, he, he, he really credited me for sort of, I guess, the, the, yeah, the range of emotion that I ended up putting into the character, even though that wasn't his idea of a hero. Mm -hmm. His idea of a hero was the guy less moving, more, more Clint Eastwood, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Michael last, good. good. Yes, darling. Um, when and where and what are coming next? Uh, you know, I mean, I did two films last year, one in Greece that was like a Greek language film. I'm kind of interested in the world, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, I'm interested and I'm kind of not interested in a way in, the, in, in, in being a, like completely commercial actor. You, you know, I, I kind of yearn for storylines that are, are, are gonna, I don't know, just do something about the illness of the planet. You know, something, something you know, Spartacus kind of had that in a way, because it made everybody who sort of feels like they're a little bit trapped in the world they're in, you know, so, and they had a very diverse um, range of uh, both uh, cultures that were represented or sexualities. Were, it was, everyone was basically represented in, cult, in, in, in some way. I, was, I had a conversation with the guys who did MASH the other night, and it was amazing how MASH was set in a war zone, so you had all the horror and conflict of the world, but you had this comedy that was going on between, you know, and so, and so there's so many bases, the really, really good stuff manages to take a story and then have this massive universal appeal. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to just sort of find vehicles like that. COVID, you know, we were all stuck in a cage for, for three years. And really just the last year, I did one film in Poland, right when the Ukrainian thing was happening. And that was an interesting glimpse into the world when I was there. And then I, I did a film in Greece, 
that's just about to come come out in uh, in Greece this month, and um, and I felt like I was part of the world filmmaking kind of thing. You know, it, was, it felt really diverse and part of that. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I I feel like you know, like I'm just about to start a film here in Atlanta. As soon as this finishes, I'm going to going to meet with the, the producer and director tomorrow night, um, playing a Cuban uh, bad guy. <laughs> But I'm thinking like I'm thinking like Scarface, you know. Yeah. It's a really big opportunity, actually, you know. So I was at a, I was at a speakeasy bar last night, and they sold cigars at the back. And so I spent the whole night with this cigar, kind of working out how I'm going to. Because I watched I watched an interview with Fidel Castro, Cuba, you know, and, and and he did the whole interview without taking the cigar out of his mouth, and I found it interesting. So I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm sort of formulating this new character, and uh, yeah, I feel like you know things are just starting to open back up again. So. And I feel I feel revived, you know. I feel better for the break in between. And uh, you know, it's not like, look, I mean, you know, 15, 10 years ago, you know, when I was the lead of Spartacus and stuff like that, you know, like these, you know, I know I'm not the the current flavor, but uh, and you know that doesn't really matter. It, but I but I hope that you know I'll get some roles that'll touch some people, and I'll enjoy the kind of the. Uh, the you know the popularity or that it, not not the popularity like feed your ego but just to know that you're involved in something that's touching people and connecting you with people out there you know that's my hope yeah please everybody give a huge round of applause for Mano Ben thank you so much Mano I appreciate your time thank you so much yeah, thank you thank you hi this is Maisie Richardson Sellers and you are watching Fandom Spotlight be a legend and hit that like button and most importantly have fun and follow your fandom.